Greetings, dear friends. Welcome to Church in the Home. It's our joy once again to come to you with the gospel of Jesus Christ that we believe can liberate and set human beings free just as God intended. So we're glad you're in the audience today and pray that the Lord's blessings be upon you. If there be any of you sick, Christ can heal you. Any of you in trouble, Christ can deliver you. Whatever your need is, Christ in you is a hope of glory and he is the hope of everyone who gets into trouble and has trials and heartaches. But whatever your need is, Jesus is the answer. He is the only answer. And I trust that you'll turn to him today. We also pray that we will say something and do something today that will be a special blessing to each one of you. We hope that every one of you that are using church in the home as a means of sharing with others the gospel, that you'll keep literature on hand. Be sure and go to the nearest Christ Life office nearest you and get some literature. If you're in the European area, you can go to Lance in London and he will give you supply of literature that'll help you and to help you to share with others and to talk to others about this Christ that lives in them. In Australia, we have Jenny there who can help you. Wherever you are, there's somebody that can help you to share this message with others and we trust that you'll do so. Well, this is the Christmas time this is a time that's most beautiful in the year for me. I love Christmas. I don't mind all the junk that comes along with it because I see through that to Jesus. I see behind everything to Christ. I see behind the Christmas tree another tree upon which he died. I see through Christmas to Christ. I see through old Santa Claus who's given gifts to everybody to the one who gave us life, to the one who is a giver of all good gifts and that's our Heavenly Father. I just see through everything in Christmas to Christ, and I hope you do too. This world needs to know Jesus, and they need to get to him in whatever way possible, because without Christ, they have an incompleted life. We're glad to be with you today, and we'll ask Robbie to say whatever's on her heart right now. I just wanna wish you a Christ-filled Christmas this year. Um, Seems like this year has rolled around quite quickly. Uh, it seems like it should be like June or July to us, and here it is going into December already. But um, I think my, my concern about Christmas this year is uh, with so many attacks on Christmas in the world and politics and, and even some of the religious circles, um, I think one of the other attacks on Christmas has to do with all the fantasy that is in our world. and. I think I think uh, Christmas kind of get, gets lumped into a fantasy uh, arena with everything else, and uh, this is something that uh, parents are going to have to take the responsibility and and uh, remove Christmas from the fantasy world and and really make this a a Christ-filled <coughs> Christmas. Make it about Christ, not about you, not about the gifts, not about the the commercialization, but really make this Christmas about Christ. And Warren and I have uh, been traveling quite a bit, as you know, we always do. And um, came home from this trip and I was really uh, starting to feel it and I had a heavy schedule in front of me. And I started thinking, I really don't know how I'm gonna make this uh, schedule that I'm facing. And I remembered the Apostle Paul's words that but Christ told him, my grace is sufficient. And those words just really filled me with um, an energy and um, a rest uh, amidst the hectic schedule that we're in. And uh, I, just, uh, I just relied on Christ because he said that when we're weak, then he's strong for his strength is made perfect in weakness, that's our weakness. And um, I just wanna thank the Father for health, for energy, and for his grace that uh, keeps us going, keeps us on the road, and keeps us facing a very busy and hectic schedule. We love our family out there. We trust that um, uh, when you get a chance, you'll contact us. We don't do quite well with uh, answering emails, but um, I think that's our annual 
resolution every year that we're going to do better with with some of the correspondence and emails but uh, just know we love you and uh, if you need us just give us a call or or contact us and uh, just know we're here for you amen I just want to say once again a Merry Christmas to everybody now let's get right into the scriptures if we can if you will take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 2. Now I'm doing something special today, and that is I've asked my granddaughter, Anna, if she would read the Christmas story to you. We know there may be many young people and children around the world who sit in front rooms and view this with grandma or mother or somebody, and uh, we just wanted you to have a fresh sight of somebody young as she reads the scripture to us, and this is my text for the message today. Go right ahead, Hannah. Okay. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she would be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now this portion of scripture takes us right into the heart of what I want to talk to you about in this message. The many wonderful things that the Lord has accomplished in his unbelievable plan goes beyond our comprehension. It is my feeling that most of the world still doesn't know what it is exactly that God is doing in our world today. And as a result, everybody's come up with their own idea and their own way of translating the scriptures and translating the things of the Lord into the common areas of humanity and miss the whole point really about what God is doing. Christmas is really all about a birthing. And that's probably the most important part about Christmas, but it is also the part about Christmas that is most criticized, most not believed in. I've been told that over 50% of religious ministries and many of them bona fide Christian ministries do not believe in the virgin birth. But here at this place, we not only believe that it happened in Bethlehem long ago that Christ was born, born of a virgin, born as a savior in this world. But it also means that it opened up to us a new understanding of what human beings were to have happened to them. Just as Christ was born into this world by another who knew no man, so has every born-again believer been birthed by God, knew no man, 
but have had placed in them the seed of God, whereby we've had a Christmas too. Christmas that took place long ago when the angel appeared unto Mary and said that there is a seed that had been placed in you and this seed comes from the Heavenly Father and this seed is Christ who will save the world from their sins. So it is that when every human being now is born again, they have this same seed put in them, the same Christ in them as their hope of glory. And so Christmas is really all about a birthing. Now, most of the world has missed this. Most of the religious world has missed this. Most of the religious world doesn't believe that a human being can be born again, let alone, as Jesus said, they must be born again. They don't even believe that it can happen. But to those that do believe it, and to those who do practice this very biblical truth, where Christ is placed in the believer and a new life is given to them, a new creation life, a whole new existence is introduced to the human once they accept Christ as their personal Savior. All of this comes back to Christmas, more or less, because it was at Christmas that humanity got the first idea of what it is God is doing on this earth. What he was doing was, was bringing his son in a literal sense to this earth to live among us, to be one of us, and finally to die with us and for us on the cross. At the same time, it was God's intention that this be perfected, that it be continued. And it was, with the coming of the Apostle Paul's ministry, we're introduced to the great mystery, the great mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the great mystery which signally says that every human being can and will have Christ in them. There's a second thing that happened at Christmas that is being further reproduced today. And that is the Christ that is birthed in us is a projection of the Father's nature. That we not only have what some people call a figurative thing called a new birth or a idealistic thing called a new birth, but we have a literality that has to do with the new birth being born again. When we are born again, we not only receive the Father's seed, which we now know to be Christ, but we also receive in that seed the very nature of God. You have to always remember that when God decided to put Christ in human beings to be their life, that his intention was that this would be the best way for human beings to become my child as if I had birthed them or I did birth them myself, as if... I had taken my own life and put it in them through my son, Jesus. This is plainly spoken of in many different ways in the Gospels where Jesus says, I can do nothing of myself. Or he would say, I only do what I see my father do. Or he would say, the father and I are one. So God had it in his mind, a part of his plan, that when he placed Christ in human beings, that the human would have in them for the first time the very nature of their father. The God nature would be in them. So when a believer is rebirthed, they have entered into that phase of God's ultimate intention that his children have his very nature. Now it is believed by many psychologically and I suppose scientifically that the nature of a child comes directly from the father who is the projector of the seed, who is the one who places the seed in the mother and causes a child to be born. And so the nature comes from the father. When a believer is born again, they have the God nature. Now this supersedes anything religious we have ever to happen to us. I grew up in a Baptist church. I grew later into uh, Pentecostalism. I grew later into faith ministries and, and now then I've come to Paul's ministry as the ultimate and the final way of knowing God. But in all of these things I had the God nature in me and didn't know it. 
because the Apostle Paul is the only one that ever makes that clear in any of his writings about who and what we are by Christ in us. So Christ's birth in a human being is their Christmas. That's, that's really what it's all about. We are honoring by the celebration of Christmas the fact that Christ now lives in human beings. Think about that for a moment. Because you're not going to get that message anywhere in the world. You're not going to get this message from most in religion. But every born-again believer is able to celebrate a continuous Christmas. What is Christmas? Christmas is where the lights are beautiful, where the plan of God opens up. Christmas is where uh, we see the nature of God in action, in, in giving uh, old Santa Claus. He is personified this aspect in that he is the giver. But the giver is that nature within us, Christ that is in us. The God nature is a giving nature. So we could go on and on and discuss and talk about those various aspects that are a, a part of our unique creation. So what has happened to the human being is that when he is born again, he enters into a Christmas of his own. He enters into a place where God has put his seed in him. And this is more than just making a person religious or even a spiritual being. It is more than that. What it is really, it's God finishing his creation. Every person that is rebirthed, who accepts Christ as their Savior, uh, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So the creation is there, but it doesn't become a finished creation until we come to the knowledge that God has put his seed in us and that we by that have become completed human beings. Always keep in mind that no human being born on this earth is completed on God's part until they accept Christ as their Savior. And so it is important that we look into some of these aspects and get, get, the, get the real feeling about what it means to be a, a Christian, what it means to be saved. Because all of this opens up to us at Christmas. I love Christmas. I have always loved Christmas. As a little boy, I liked it because I got things from it. But now I love Christmas because I see through everything there to what is God's plan, how he intended that another person living in the human being would bring the joy and the happiness and the peace that we have in knowing Christ as our life. We really have to go to the manger to see God's plan in its simplicity. Oh, it's such a simple plan. It's such a simple plan to see that religion and theologians and men still argue over the fact or no fact of the virgin birth. To see that it all gets wasted in them trying to figure it out is critical. It's critical because it's a very simple thing. When God sent his son to this earth, that son had come to this earth to finish what was in God's plan from the very beginning. He came to this earth to complete human beings by putting another life in them, not trusting what the human being had come to within himself, not trusting the human being to perfect himself in any way. His whole intention was to put another life in the human being, and that's what Christianity is all about. When we go to the manger, we see how simple it was. God had put his seed in the little 14-year-old girl in Nazareth, Mary, and finally she came to the bringing forth of the child some nine months later. It was a simple thing. 
because every person coming to life in this world comes to life exactly as Jesus did in little Mary. But it was a God seed. And now then, as born-again believers, we're able to see how that God placing His Son in us, Christ in us, our hope of glory, is a very simple thing. But it's a thing that you have to learn about, know about, come to the knowledge of. The Scriptures are clear. But there's so many people who read the Scriptures who just don't get it. They just don't get the idea at all about what it means to be a Christian. And so when you go to the manger, you can see some very important things that happened on that Christmas morning when Christ came into the world and had his beginning of his birthdays. We celebrate his birthday now, but that in the manger was before it had his first year, in fact. Two or three things about Mary I want to talk to you about. One of them is she was chosen. She was a chosen vessel. She was chosen by God out of all the young women in the world of that day. It was an awesome thing that God chose Mary of Nazareth. It was an awesome thing that he was going to trust a little 14-year-old girl at that time a 14-year-old girl was like a, like a full-grown woman almost. And nowadays, they're, they're just teenagers. But he trusted her with the awesome responsibility of bringing forth Christ out of her life. She was a chosen vessel. And so that opens up the idea that every human being is nothing but a vessel. We were intended by God to be vessels. We first possessed a life that was contrary to our creation. Wasn't anything in our creation that fit the old sin nature that was put in us when Adam and Eve committed their sin and passed it on to us. But that same old sin nature never fit us. It will never fit a human being. I don't care what people in the world say I don't care what very sinful people say about how happy and how wonderful it is for them to be who they are. I'd have to tell you that they're never what they ought to be without Christ in them because they were created to be vessels needing another life in them. And so even as Mary was chosen out of all the young women in the world of her day, so have everyone who accepts Jesus as their Savior a chosen vessel to possess this same Christ. Christ in you. Chosen by God and placed in you has been another life. Now you can live in religion all your days after accepting Jesus as a Savior and never come to the knowledge of this life in the Son. John would say in his epistle, that the life is in the Son. And he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. It's that simple. So the life that is in the human being as a Christian is the Son life. It's Christ in you. That's Christmas. That's where you ought to wake up every day to the beautiful and the glorious aspect of Christmas, knowing what Christmas is, knowing what Christmas is can do for you. It is the Spirit of God working in the believer, bringing out the love of God, the joy of the Lord, and the peace of God. Well, Mary was chosen. Every one of us are chosen too. In Ephesians 1 and 4, one of our prime texts says that according as He has chosen us in Christ chosen us to be in Christ before the world was created. Well, you see, dear friends, you and I are nothing but vessels. We, we are containers that were created by God to contain Christ. Our container has been messed up by Adam's sin and an old sin nature. But at the cross, Jesus put the sin nature out and made us new creations in Christ Jesus, new creations in Christ Jesus. 
Second thing about Mary was that during her time that Christ was undelivered in her from the time that the Holy Spirit placed the seed in her to the time she was ready to deliver the child, she went nine months in a very difficult period. One thing that made that first Christmas morning in Bethlehem so important was that she was through with one great trial of having Christ in her and having to stand alone under God's authority to bear this child. I make no pretense to you that once you see Christ as your life, that God has placed his seed in you and Christ is beginning to take over your whole being in your life. It won't be an easy thing. It's kind of like the woman's nine month of pregnancy. It's kind of like the hurt and the pain that comes with the ultimate delivery of the child. We see some wonderful things happen during that period of time. Mary had no one to turn to. She had no one that cared. Her family had stood against her. Her brothers and uh, sisters, whatever there was in the family, had stood against her. She was all alone. There wasn't anybody outside of her family that knew what was going on who stood with her except one lady several miles away was a lady named Elizabeth. She was heavy with child too. This was all a God thing. And so Mary, I believe, led of the Spirit, went to see Elizabeth. And Elizabeth had that foreknowledge of the Holy Spirit working in her and knew, knew something about Mary. And so she built her up. While there, Elizabeth said to her that that holy thing which is in you shall save us from our sins. Christ in you brings forth that very truth. You may not know it, but just as Christ was in Mary, Christ in you today is a living Savior through you for a dying world. Bear that in your mind. It'll not be an easy life to come to the assurance of who you are in Christ. Though this is Paul's almost entire message, Christ in you, the hope of glory, it is still necessary that you bear the responsibility in the hope that all of the pain and hurt that you have will bring forth a glorious time in Christ, in the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's right. One other thing she went through. She had a continual confirmation, I think from the Holy Spirit and from the powers that God had sent to minister to her. A constant confirmation. As you know, I often make the statement that our forgetter works better than I remember. And the confirmation becomes important. A fellow said to me one time, why is it every time you get up and talk, you talk about Christ living in human beings? Well, of course, I thought that was a very foolish question he asked me. I answered it eventually. But it was foolish because there is no other kind of salvation. Christianity has no other hope other than Christ living in us. He's our hope of glory. And so for us to get the idea, that's all you're talking about, seems kind of strange to me. It's strange because most Christians don't know it. As I often say, 90% of born-again Christians do not know that Christ lives in them and that that was God's main plan of salvation. That was the way he intended that he do it. So what do we do? When we preach the gospel, we confirm it. I've heard of 
people who preached a single gospel. There's one or two great men in the past that every time they preached, they preached the love of God. That's powerful. That's, that's a great message. Uh, when I was Baptist, every time we preached, we preached something about salvation, getting saved, because that's the way you fill up a church building and you get people to go to work for the Lord and as well as save them out of hell. But uh, you, you kind of had a single message. Well, I've got a single message now, and that message is the confirmation that Christ lives in every believer that has been saved. Every believer born again has Christ living in them. That's the real thing about Christmas. That's why I had Anna to read scripture because I wanted that to be an important point made in this message. Because I think little children sitting around a Christmas tree are looking at all the presents and all of the, the glitz and the glory of Christmas decorations and so forth. I want them to know that the purpose of all of it was somebody who birthed a child that made the difference. The difference is in Christ. That's his name, Christ must Christmas. Well, the world may have come up with other names. They tried to do that, you know. They tried to do that last year to give it other names, and that didn't work good in America. So we're confirmers. My purpose in life is to confirm to everybody every time I get a chance that they have no life of their own. It's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, yet I do live. Though it is not I, it is Christ who lives in me. So we come to this very important place where we confirm to each other, as Elizabeth did to Mary. When you see somebody in need, you see somebody that hurts, somebody that's sick, somebody going through a hard time, if they have accepted Christ as their Savior, what you need to do is to be a confirmer to them. What do you confirm? You confirm that Christ lives in them. You confirm that. That's what Elizabeth did to uh, Mary. When Mary was downcast and had nowhere else to turn, God gave Elizabeth the message that that holy thing within you is to save us from our sins. And so our mission is to do the same. We are to confirm that. What's behind it all? Out of these vessels made out of dirt, we are to bring forth a Savior. Everyone that is human has Christ in them when they accept Jesus as their Savior. That Jesus wants to come forth from them like they are. That's what Christianity is. And so each one of us are to bring forth a living Savior to a world that's dying. It's dying and perishing all about us. I know you can get mad at the things going on in the world, but that's a dying issue. You understand that? I don't like what's on television. I don't like what's in the movies. I don't like what religion is doing in a lot of places. But you know what? All of that's dying. That has no fruitfulness. That has no future because it's dying. Our mission is to bring forth a living Savior to that dying world. Always when I visit somebody that's sick or go to a hospital where I'm to minister to people, the first thing I tell them when I get there is, Christ in you is your hope. Not me, not somebody's prayer of faith, but Christ in you is your hope. He's the answer. When you go through a struggle, it's Christ in you that makes the difference. And so I encourage you to that all-important truth. We've had an onslaught against Christ here in our own nation in the last couple of years worse than I have ever known. That's because we've got such a 
open and even vulgar media system in America that it had rather deal with what is negative and wrong than anything that's right. And so we, we've had a real onslaught. A little over a year ago, there was a group of people who met that was known as the Jesus Seminar. You probably didn't hear much about them. I'm hearing more about it today than I did when it happened. But the Jesus Seminar was a group of uh, people put together who were upset over Christianity. They thought Christianity was becoming too bold and was too biased and something needed to be done with Christianity. So they labeled themselves with the title, The Jewish Jesus Seminar. And their purpose was to try to rescue people from Christianity. And so what they wanted to do first was to get Jesus out of Christmas. And the only way they could do that was to change the name of the holiday. And they, they tried to do that. And several of our leading uh, corporations in America decided they'd go along with that and try to, try to uh, get Jesus out of the holiday and, and make it mostly nothing but a holiday. And then all of the unbelievers and sinful people could join in because everybody loves a holiday. But you know what happened? Uh, most of those, in fact, as far as the account I have read, is that all of those who had a desire to stamp Jesus out of Christmas have repented of it during the last year. I ran into a fellow the other day who had written three or four letters three or four different times to all these companies, and they by his letters and I suppose millions of others got the message that that's the wrong thing to do. That's, that's a bad thing to do. And so I understand there's still just one major company that's holding out to no use of the word Christmas in any form. So they tried their best to stamp it out. And what they'd really like to have is a world without Christ in it. And that's kind of foolish, you know. Have you ever read Colossians chapter 1? All things were made by Christ and that there is not anything in existence except by Christ. Romans 8 will say, all things work together because of Christ. You just can't get away from it. The Bible is really a book of truth. Have you noticed that? Regardless of what anybody says, there are some very truthful things in the Bible. In fact, all of them are. But what the world would like is to have a Jesus that is relevant to fit in our ungodly world today. That's what they'd really like. They'd like to have uh, what I call a soulish Jesus. Not, not a spiritual Christ not one that is joined to the spirit of the human and involves the cross and the human has been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, resurrected with Christ, ascended with Christ in heavenly places. They don't want a spiritual Jesus where you spiritualize it. They want a soulish Christ. They want a soulish Christ. Uh, one of the great things came out of the Jesus seminar was that we need a Christ today that speaks to the needs of the ecological crisis we're living in. Ecology. Some people call them tree huggers. That's their religion. Tree huggers. So they said, what we need is a Jesus that's a tree hugger. He's out here saving the animals, saving the trees, saving the universe. That's the Jesus we need. And yet, I hear Paul saying in Colossians 1, Colossians 1 that there's not anything that is made that he didn't make. 
nothing he made. We uh, had a little experience this past week. We were some friends over in uh, in uh, Euless, uh and this was a pharma uh, uh, family that was in. Uh, they had moved here from India, became Christians in India, and moved here. So we kind of got on s- s- near a subject I'm talking about now. And we were standing out in the lady's front yard as we were leaving. And she pointed down. and she said, you see that house down there? Four houses away. See what they're doing? She said, they're all putting up Christmas lights. And they're decorating the Christmas tree. And she said, you know what? They're not Christians. She said, none of them are Christians. They just come out of India. But you know what they were doing? They were celebrating Christmas. You see, that's why I'd like to leave Christmas alone and not change anything. Because that's as close as some people are going to get to Christ. And if they don't get that close, the Holy Spirit may never be able to reach them. See? So I thought, what foolishness it is for us to fight every little thing we don't like about Christmas. It has to do with a birthing. I don't like all the junk goes on at Christmas, but I see through it. I see through it. I see through it to Christ because he's the shadow in behind it of the reality, the reality of it. And so they wanted an ecological Jesus, one that would join them in saving this world. And you know, the minute I thought about that, I thought about the what is it, 18 times in the 17th chapter of John in the Lord's Prayer where Jesus uses the word world and most of the time he uses it negatively saying, I pray not for the world, but I pray for those which God has given me out of the world. Think of all the times he had such a voice to talk about the world. Well, second thing they wanted, they wanted a Christ that was married to the nuclear crisis. I'm not for sure what the nucleus, nuclear crisis is. Uh, we're not all handling uh, atom bombs or any atoms or anything nuclear that I know of. However, we may be getting close to it in hospitals and other places where they're using a lot of nuclear things. But the Jesus Seminar said we need a Christ that fits the nuclear crisis. Well, all I could think of is ever since the atom bomb was dropped, everybody's been scared to death of nuclear power. We're scared to death now what's going to happen in in, uh, North Korea or in Iran or somewhere else where some uh, fool or nut or ignoramus gets hold of nuclear power. But these folks have decided they wanted a Jesus that is married to the nuclear crisis. Wouldn't it be simple instead of trying to rearrange the world for Jesus to let Christ work through the world he's created? Seems to me like that would be better. And then they said, we'd like to have a feminist Jesus. A feminist Jesus. One that would be interested in the female more than males or anything else. Might be good. But they couldn't take the Jesus who says that we're one in him. Or the Apostle Paul that says, In Christ, there is no male or female subjectively. In Christ, we're one. So they want to change, to change, to get Jesus out of it. Last of all, they said there needs to be a new Christianity. 
that the old Christianity doesn't work anymore. That the old Christianity has no answers for our world today. You know what? I'm going to keep hitting it like a hammer on a nail until people I talk to get it or don't get it. But I don't want people just to let it lay. So I'll say it again. Christianity is not a religion. It was never intended to be a religion. It never fits anything that has to do with religion. Why is it that people who really read and study their Bible leave church buildings? Because there's no relationship between religion often and what's said in the scriptures. Because Christianity doesn't fit religion and you can't dress it up to look like religion. Religion is what men do to please God. Christianity is what Christ did for man to please God. There's no such thing as Christianity being a religion. So get it, get it fixed in your mind. Let's talk a little bit more about that in another way. What makes Christ so different, so absolutely different in our world today? Why would I say that Christianity is not a religion? Because Jesus is the only world progenitor of anything that has to do with God or religion. He is the only one who was ever pre-announced about his coming into this world. can't find another. There is not another religious leader who was pre-announced coming into this world. Not a one. You can find plenty of them that said God told them this and God told them that, but you can't find a one that can put his finger on any facts that God said they would come into the world and what they would do. Not Mohammed, not Confucius, not Buddha, or a thousand other idols that have been made gods. Not a one of them was ever prophesied ahead of time that they'd come into the world. I don't want. And yet every religion, even in Christianity, its certain direction it's taken and its certain belief of scriptures, every one of them have a man or a woman that started. Every one of them. And you'd be surprised how they lay heavy on that. Brigham Young, he's big. But he wasn't prophesied ahead. He started Mormonism. Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventist. She wasn't prophesied ahead. Mary Baker Eddy, she wasn't prophesied ahead. No great religious leader has ever been prophesied ahead. That's very important because Christianity only has one that was prophesied ahead and that was Christ. This is a true yardstick to put on what it is you believe. For instance, if God was going to set up a way of worship and a way of living among earthly people, how would he do it? Point one, 
he would say, I'm sending a messenger. That the Spirit of the Lord is upon him and he shall bring the gospel. He would send a messenger, just like he did. Over 700 years before he came, we have written records that God said, I'm sending the messenger who will save his people from their sin. He went further. God said he's going to be born in a place called Bethlehem. Hundreds of years before he got here. That's not religion. That's not somebody taking the scriptures and making up doctrine. That's God setting up Christianity, what it really is. So God never intended that there would be no specific truth concerning the sending of Jesus into this world. Not only that, he gave specific instructions where Jesus would live in Nazareth hundreds of years before. He went to the degree of saying what doctrine Jesus would teach hundreds of years before. He even went to the degree of saying who the enemies would be that Christ would have. Last of all, he took time in several chapters like Genesis uh, 3 and Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53 to talk about his death and pinpoint what must happen when he died. So Christianity doesn't fit the mold of anything in religion. Nothing. Doesn't have any points of religion to it. But you and I have allowed the world to make Christianity a religion. So our politicians get up and say, now what we need is Islam and Christianity and all of the world's religions to feel free and happy in America. Attempting to make Christianity a religion. That's my Christmas message. He that was born didn't get here by accident. Wasn't a little girl that had an affair and bore a child. It was the coming of a savior who at least 700 years, that's the least, and goes back all the way to Genesis, pinpoints what he's to do when he gets here. And there is no other human that ever lived that had that ever said about them. That's right. Not a one. That's good. Not a one. You see, if God hadn't pinpointed what Jesus was to do when he got here, where he would live, what he would teach, how he would be hated, how he would die on the cross. If God hadn't gone into all that detail, then some man could come up and say, I'm sent from God, and if you listen to me, you'll have the truth. Or he could come saying, uh, an angel has appeared unto me and has given me a special gospel. Exactly what has gone on in the religious world has taken place. But God has had no part of it because he has specifically said what would take place and what would happen to his dear son. I want you to have a feeling for Christmas. When I see the world misuse Christmas 
To me, it's good and bad. I don't like to see Jesus hurt, but I don't like to see him put out of the way either. I like to see whatever it is they'll bring up of Christ so that someone might really see and know who Christ is. You see, it's kind of like that with humans. If you and I live our life and never make a witness for Christ, then he's laid dormant in us. He's nothing to us. You picked up your old other life and try to make it a religious life, contrary to the fact that Christ in you now is your life. You have a great power in you to share and to give to other people because Christ in you is your light. He is your life. He is your message. He's your all. I read a thing this week from uh, Lee Scobo, who, who is the, uh, he is a reporter, the Chicago Sun-Times, and he's gotten into this theory of writing where he finds proof, trying to find proof of the existence of Jesus and the gospel and so forth. He spends all his time trying to find that truth. And he told a story that uh, some bad times had come to Chicago and a lack of money, lack of jobs was really pressing certain people. And he heard about a woman who lost her husband and had no income or anything. So he thought he'd just make an example out of her and, and write a story in the newspaper. So he went to see her. And when he got there, there was hardly any furniture in the house. Uh, there was a mother and two daughters. They lived very poorly. And he looked all around, made notes about what was happening to poor families in Chicago during this particular time. And the two girls had no clothes to wear. They only had one sweater between the two of them. And during the very cold period of time, at that time, when they walked to school, they had to walk to school over a mile in the cold. And the way they'd do it, the girls would trade the sweater. One of them would wear the sweater halfway and the other would wear it the other way, the other halfway. And he said it was such a sharing family. And said he asked them, how in the world do you all continue in this? Why don't you go get some help? Oh, the mother said, we have all the help we need. We don't have all the things we need, but we got to help. He said, what's that? She said, it's Jesus. He says, just Jesus. Well, he couldn't get over it. So he went back and he wrote his story and told about all their problems and needs. And a few days went by, and he decided to go back and see this family again. So he went back to their house, and when the door was open to let him in, you couldn't walk through the house. There was so much stuff there. Since his article in the newspaper, people in Chicago had responded and they had new furniture, they had a car, they had money to go in the bank, they had more food than they could handle. They just had stuff as it is coming out their ears everywhere. And so he said, uh, what are you going to do with all this? And the mama said, as quick as I can, I'm going to give it all away. He said, you mean you're going to give it away? Yep, as much as I can. Because she said, there are people in greater need than I. And said, that's the least I can do. Is to help them with my great amount of stuff. That's the birthing. That's what Christmas is all about. That there has been birthed in human beings another life. 
out of the life is not yours, it's Christ. But you are a Christian, a place where Jesus lives, a vessel that contains him. Christ in you. Christ in you. Don't you see why Paul mentioned that in his brief 14 epistles 164 times? He said just in Christ. Why would he do that? Because that's what, the, that's what life is all about. It isn't your life, it's his life. It's him in you. We are givers. With Christ in us, we're no longer takers. If it kills us, we're no longer takers, we're givers. It's him on the cross, dying, painful, hurt, turned against, spit upon. It's him on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. I'm not telling you to go give away everything you got. I'm not talking to you about what you do. I'm talking to you about who you are. You've been birthed to be a Christian. Christians are not religious. They are motivated by another power that goes beyond religion. Christians may have programs, preachers, places to meet, and all sorts of things at their disposal, but they don't need any of them because their life is not in those things. Their life is in the sun. Jesus in you is the same. I often marvel at people. There's a lot of people that love the statement where I think out of Hebrews where he says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And they use that to prove miracles. That you'll get your miracle. He's still the same. But that isn't all that that means. That means that the Christ in you is the same Yesterday, today, and forever. Your problem is learning Him. Your problem is coming to know Him. Because until you know Him, you'll never know who you are. You'll never know who you are as a Christian until you know Christ who lives in you. And if Christ doesn't live in you, then you're going to live and die and never be a truth yourself. You'll never be a reality because you'll never know who you are because it's Christ in us that completes our creation. A completed creation is Christ alive. And so it is. With that, I'll quit. I got notes leading on and on and on, but that's enough. I really believe this. I sincerely believe this. That the birthing of Christ is God's first truth into what humans are. They are completed by Christ in them. And I encourage you to let Christ come through you. Give a living Savior to a dying world. That's what Mary did. That's what you can do in your own way. So do it. Amen. I quit. You sure been a good group today. God love you for being here. I want you to have a Merry Christmas. I want you to look at everything you see from bright lights to Christmas trees to Santa Claus and see through it to Christ. See through it to Christ. Because that's where the life is. The life is in the sun. Amen. All right. I really will quit now.
Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand, will you? Just reach over and take your neighbor by the hand and kind of look him in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me. In my life and all that I do, I see Jesus in me. Hug every neck you can till we meet again next Sunday.